I'm recording now. Start talking, my friend. Okay. Here's the scene. We we follow this great man throughout this journey. But we know the trauma he's faced. We know the greatness he's created. And by the end of his life, it's just really it's really moving in that we see after all these years. And I believe I think they mentioned he went through a stroke before the interview. Also, he recovered from it though. But the point is. After all this, and after his year, he has to retire because, you know, he's getting to the point where it's hard for him to draw the characters. And he, he knows, like, I'm not going to be because he knows he's dying at this point. And it's very, you know, it's just very powerful. And just you see him breaking down. He says, you know, he says, you know I might cry. And he's saying he never did kick the football because he's really talking about himself in that moment. Because to remember, I just knew Charlie Brown was a, based off some events in his life. I didn't know how much he was actually based off Charles Charles Schultz. I, mean, I knew like the red haired girl he met in real life and you know he's uh, had, a, had a dog named Spike, but it's kinda of based off Snoopy's based off and it's still just really really a surprisingly moving bit. And then the thing that really got me is the uh, throughout the interview they had these little these nice little seeds where they had the black and white peanuts characters like in the locations like a, it's a sort of effect they have the drawn characters over the location, like the pumpkin patches, Linus there, the wall where Linus and Charlie Brown always talk has like a, pic, a drawn picture there. And you see Charlie Brown in bed. And what they did was they seated this really nicely. Throughout uh, when Charles Schultz, he realized he was dying. He had cancer. He uh, basically questioning, you know, like, uh, you know, why is this happening to me and all that stuff. And it says, Charlie Brown, you see a strip of Charlie Brown in bed just saying, you know, sometimes I lie awake at night and wonder. Why? And someone says, well, your name just came up one day. Nothing personal. And then there's this really great show where you kind of – you see laid over the image of his – Charles Schultz's actual bed. You see Charlie Brown, the image, and it fades away. And then throughout all these other locations, you see the images of these characters fading away as the creator has passed. Linus fades from the pumpkin patch. Lucy fades from the uh, football field. And, yes. Yeah, the moving is a solemn existence, which kind of begs the question. He he'd never sought help. He he never sought help because he feared it would impact his trip. Mm. Because that, that was where all this material for Charlie Brown came. And uh, what really I found really interesting is that he was his wife gave him the idea towards him. Well, you know, you're not going to be around forever, so you you might just in advance write the ending to your strip, you know, like, see, Charlie Brown kicks the football finally, but Charles Schultz said that would be killing off the character in the universe, so he can't allow that, so he never let him kick the football, and he mentioned that in that interview, which really, really resonated, I guess. Damn, boy, I'm a crying. No, I'm serious, I'm literally shedding a tear, Jesus Christ. You have a future in public speaking, man, or, or storytelling, or something. Oh, I, 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 I am. I, I, it all brings back. I remember it all now. It's just, oh, it's all rushing back now. Damn. Yeah, well, I, want me to relay the moment that actually makes me get a little, it makes me get teary eyed. Oh hell yes. Okay. Hearing you talk is amazing. Here's the moment that really gets me. Now, of course, Dark Knight Rises. We all know Dark Knight Rises. Let's be honest. Oh, of course. But the. Uh, of course, you ask anyone what's their favorite moment in Dark Knight Rises. Uh, people are going to say, though, the backbreak or stuff like that. Don't get me wrong, backbreak's yeah. awesome. But uh, well, uh, what's your favorite moment, Milan? Um, I just kind of like the whole thing. I know that's a cop out, but it's it's kind of true. Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, I like stuff like when Bruce is jumping out of the pit. But the moment I can instantly go, this is my favorite moment, even past the backbreak, as much as as cool a fight as it is. The moment that always I, I say is the best moment of the film is uh, the moment where uh, Batman has to take the bomb out over the bay. But it's not just that. It's when he says goodbye to Commissioner Gordon. I'm a big Gordon fan, and that just – I love the rooftop meeting scenes. Just always the – just these two guys making – working together to make a difference, you know, change the city. The best mm. – like the human version, if you will, if that makes any sense, human Jim Gordon. He's not trained. He's not the guy who can like – you know, to go toe to toe with the Man of Steel, or well, I'm not going to get into that. But you know, the whole yeah, you know, he's not he's not Batman. He's like not a guy who can go up against Joker, Bane, or Killer Croc. He's still a guy doing everything he humanly can, much like Batman does, only with less training and stuff. Point mm. is, these two characters they've had this history together. 
and just that, that moment and the, the way it calls back to Batman Begins when he says, you know, oh, shouldn't they know the hero that saved them? He says, a hero can be anyone, even someone who does something as simple as put a coat over a boy's shoulders to show him that the world hasn't ended. And as oh, uh, I, yeah, as this moment, as this moment passes, and Gordon's like kind of stewing on it. It's this great shot from the trailer, which is my third trailer of all time, by the way. The Dark Knight Rises third trailer, where it's like Gordon's like the, the the scarf and the coat's blowing in the wind as Batman kind of like now he's done, he's made his final, he's made peace finally. Now he's leaving to save the save the world, to save Gotham, as he always would do. And it's just that moment, and Gordon kind of realizes after this flash of that moment where uh, Gordon consoled the young Bruce. Just Bruce Wayne. It's kind of Gordon in that moment, he's realizing, yes, I did make a difference like Batman. And yeah, he's kind of grasping. That is what Batman stands for. I knew he served the purpose of saving, you know, doing what he can to help bring the city back from the brink. But yeah, he's right. Anyone can make a difference. You know, yeah, I made a difference. But... I created him in a way. I'm not saying he's that, I'm not saying he's overconfident or anything, but yeah, it's just that moment of, that message coming across through Gordon, it just always moves me so much. Yeah, damn. Like, d- 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 dude, you should make more videos. It's 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 a freaking crime that you that you don't make more videos, dude. Would you care for a moment of levity? Uh, sure, why not? If I were to list off my favorite moments of Commissioner Gordon and Batman the animated series, and not mentioning the other moment, that'll probably. It'd be tearing up, or at least just kind of going, "Oh my god, it's, it's amazing!" Oh yes, that moment being the uh, the New Year's scene from a uh, New Adventures of Batman Holiday Nights episode mm-hmm. in, the, in the cafe. But other than that, I always send that around New Year's because I love it so much. Like you send everyone I know on YouTube around New Year's because it's such a great clip. But the point is, this one it's from another holiday special, uh, the first one. Christmas with the Joker, and it's, Gordon's not even in this moment. He's in the episode, but he's not in this moment. I just love it so much. It's so hilarious to me. Uh, after Batman is, you know, saved Gordon, Summer Gleason, and uh, Harvey Bullock and foiled the Joker's evil Christmas plot, mm-hmm. uh, 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 Dick Grayson, he's been saying to Bruce, you know, listen, we'll turn in for the night and we'll watch you. It's a wonderful life. Of course, Joker interrupts the broadcast, and, and by the end of it, uh, Bruce watches it, and Alfred has this wonderful line in which he says, It was awfully nice of Commissioner Gordon to lend you that uh, copy of It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> uh, makes just the idea that Gordon would lend Batman a movie. In costume, Batman. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Just like, I just imagine Batman, like, they're on that roof, you know, the whole, uh, the, t- the uh, signal is there, and Batman, like, Batman's just about to disappear. And Jim turns around and he just like lets his pipes and he's expecting Batman to be gone and he's not. It's like, hey, um, aren't you gonna disappear? And Batman's like, um, you wouldn't happen to co- you wouldn't have a you wouldn't happen to have a copy of a Wonderful Life on you. And Gordon just just like, yeah, I have one in my office. It's like, it's like thanks, man. It's yeah. just that's hysterical. I'm sorry. You know if you. This is gonna sound silly if you want to make that like a like a genuine moment. <laughs> you know what you could do yeah. after, after this and this, and they have that classic rooftop scene, <laughs> and mm-hmm. you would have uh, you Gordon saying, "Hey, listen, the equivalent, you know, thanks. You don't have to thank me. That sort of thing." Because I love that. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. the uh, what could really work is that if Gordon said, "Yeah, you got any plans for the holidays?" Well, I was gonna watch a Wonderful Life. Wonderful Life, you say? Wait right here. Goes into his office, pulls out of the drawer, pulls out a VHS tape. Goes to the rooftop, mm-hmm. hands it to Batman, says, thanks. You don't have to thank me. It's all a night's work. Or something along those lines. He basically says, Merry Christmas. And basically Batman turned, like, disappeared before he got to say Merry Christmas. But Batman would say Merry Christmas. Say, Merry Christmas to you too. Huh. Where sleigh bells when you need them. <laughs> Something along those lines. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> that'd be hysterical. I mean, you, you might think like like just one of these days, Jim Gordon is gonna do the same thing to Batman. And it's like Batman's like, it's nice. To, son of a bitch, you got me. <laughs> if, if Gordon would one, will one day get his own back with the whole disappearing act, yeah. oh, that that would be hilarious. You remember in No Man's Land when Gordon called him out on that? 
Yeah. That was great. That scene was great. I love the art in that issue, too, because the art kind of wonky in that book. I like the art in that issue the best. Yeah, the the art in No Man's End is kind of all over the place, but when it's good, it's good. Oh, yeah. Cause I like the simplistic uh, – I always love the – again, this is just me growing up with the animated series. It's defined me, but I love the simplistic style. It's like it, – it's not overly simplistic. It's, it's, it's detailed enough. Mm. Of course, they do that so you can animate it, so you don't be bogged down by all these lines, and you're always making the animation off model. You don't want that. So what you get is just this really str- oh streamline. That's the word. It's, it's this really streamlined style. It looks really great. Yeah, it's 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 really great. Like, it's, that's the weird thing. Like people, a lot of people love their kind of streamlined Batman. Others just really like their simple, clean cut Batman. But yeah, it's all a matter of taste. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 weird because back in the eighties, uh, like with uh, cartoons like the X Men and what and GI Joe, it would, they kind of went for this weird quasi realistic looking thing. Yeah, and it it looked all kind of fleshy, and you know it looked cool for the time. But you know that's what Bruce Tim did. He kind of said, okay, how about we just uh, focus on more. Um, We'll go for more of a, a simple, clean line Fleischia look. And they did, and it looked fantastic. It was more, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not cartoony. Um, hmm. Not abstract. Um, simplistic, just very simple shapes. Streamline? That kind of work. Streamline, that's the word I'm looking for. It's very streamlined. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, you were saying? No, I wasn't saying anything. Uh, you were saying? I was going to say, uh, you want to hear my pitch for uh, an opening to Man of Steel, too? Sure, I'd love to. Okay, I got two ideas. Okay, I just like kind of, I don't think, I think Man of Steel should primarily be set in uh, Metropolis. Basically, you don't need Gotham at all, really. You can just have Metropolis and your villains would be Lex Luthor and Metallo. Mm-hmm. That was my idea before I heard Batman in there, but, you know, it would be nice to see that. And plus, you could use Batman as kind of the... Uh, the arc device in which Luthor and Bruce come from the same perspective. Yeah, look at what this guy did. Now, it's Superman becoming an actual Superman by the end, but the point where he would save people during battles and, you know, like, kind of steering it away. Like, he, he better himself, by example, of Batman, working with Batman, kind of learning, uh, my action to have consequence, and I got to strive uh, to be better. Like, you know, or my say, look what happened. I got Luthor out of what happened in the first movie. And we get perceived differently by... People of Earth and Bruce would say, okay, this guy isn't bad at all. He's just a little, he's new at this stuff. And Luthor would just be Luthor. And that, you know, this guy outlined to the government, yeah, look at the, look, look at what this guy did. I've been studying the solar rays in theory, what would weaken Superman. Also, I found this material uh, from the shattered remains of the spaceship in Metropolis. And basically, he melts that down with other metals to make Metallo. Mm. And, uh, you know, kryptonite would rain due to the, effects of the phantom phantom drive like it accelerate like kind of a hole in the space fabric time that would have meteorites of kryptonite rain down from the planet but I, i'm over exasperating sorry but uh, the idea is if you were to have like a, just a moment of awesomeness kind of that you go into the theater say okay i'm gonna sit down go see superman just you don't know anything about batman but i know it's impossible but you say you don't know anything that batman's gonna be in this movie you just walk into man of steel 2 sitting down okay Wait, this isn't Metropolis. Where are we? We're in Gotham, and we're in the midst of a crime in Gotham. We're taken off guard. We're seeing a new city. It's like, well, where's Superman? I came in here to see Superman. But no, what happens is, for the start, just one scene, like an opening, we either, A, have the alt- take advantage of Zack Snyder's visual style. We have... Uh, heavily uh, owed to the animated series. I know it's a little self-indulgent on my part, but just hear me out. One second, uh, oh, sure. recording thing. Uh, recording. Th- and, uh, yep, continue. Okay, so here's here's the idea for the opening. We see an explosion in Gotham. We see this great establishing shot of Gotham in the city. We're kind of just panning down. Then an explosion happens. Essentially, the opening to Batman the Animated Series unfolds in kind of bringing it to to the screen using that Zack Snyder style. Which would be a nice use of his talents, I, I think. You know, using like the shadow and the shade and keeping people in silhouette. You know, the two guys are running and basically they're going into a building while they're being chased by cops. Now, they're entering building. Of course, the logic would be running out to the other side of the building. You don't go upwards, otherwise you have no way off there. 
But uh, they're about to head out, but a battering flies across, hits the door. They can't get out, so they go up. They go up. We don't see Batman yet. They're going up, and basically they reach the rooftop, and Batman has beat them there. He's in silhouette, classic profile from the animated series. You know, the, the opening unfolds. You know, just like dodge the punch, you know, leaps on the one guy, and basically the cops would get up there, and just they're, you know, tied up together, and then we see a great Dark Knight Returns-ish lightning across Batman. And the opening, and then it would end with uh, the scene between Batman and Gordon. Again, kind of self indulgent on my part, but here we are. Basically, Gordon said, you know, thanks. Or, like, you know, nice nice work tonight. And all the night's work. You know what's funny? Considering what's been going on in the world lately, this is a. Uh, we should count ourselves lucky. Lucky? So, yeah, you hear about uh, these quote unquote aliens are in Metropolis or something? They All the stuff they went through, like, last month. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing, but. Anyway, so he would, uh, Gordon have a newspaper in his hand, and he says, I guess every city has their guardian, I suppose. Like, we have you, uh, so you have some competition elsewhere. Basically, Batman would disappear, classic fashion. Bullock would come, would uh, walk by and say, hey, Kamish, who are you talking to? He says, well, it looks like I'm talking to my, no one, but apparently my shadow. Basically, he throws the paper on the car hood, and you'd see a picture of Superman. From Metropolis, then it would transition there to Metropolis. Huh? Mm, that's that's. Uh, if this was a Batman Superman movie, I would have I would have liked it. But it's it, that's the thing. I'm kind of uh, like I'm happy that there's an actual Superman Batman movie. But that's the thing. It's I'm afraid they're just gonna make this uh, make Man of Steel two into Batman. With Superman on the side somewhere in the background. I'm a hundred percent with you, Milan. Yeah, I mean, like, it's if I wanted, like, like Ian's just been, just been basically been smashing my balls about this, kind of saying, "Oh, you're a Superman fanboy," and I'm like, "No, Batman has like how many movies has Batman had? Like, like canonical in like series? He has like two sets of like on like ongoing films. Superman's got all he's got is like those '70s movies, and only two of those were good." And um, and like just Man of Steel was was great. I think it had its problems, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, they they showed Superman, you know, at the very end. You know, the whole film would have been perfect for me if just at the very end, after he, you know he killed Zod, you just see him helping out people, like lifting up debris and kind of you know disaster relief. Then, then the movie would have been you know completely completely perfect for me. Also, if they gave, um, you know, besides that, you know, there's more other stuff, but that's not, not the point. But the thing is, it's just, eh, like, I wanted two, at least two more Superman movies before we got, or at least one more, at the very least, one more solo Superman movie, and then, sure, you can bring in Batman, because I'm just afraid they're going to say, oh, Batman, 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 and Superman's in the corner over there. And it's just, it's, it's a Superman film, like, don't we have enough of Batman? Like I like Batman, but it's just like, uh, like everyone's. Uh, it's just I'm just sad. I'm I'm with him. I'm a huge Batman fan, but I also recognize I like Superman also, and it should be his movie because you know if it's going to be Man of Steel too, I mean Superman. It's Superman's movie. Batman's just guest starring him. Yeah, he can be a co-protagonist, but less lesser than the main guy, Superman. He yeah, exactly. Star. In an ideal world, Milan, here's what I'd love for a year, one year. We get first movie comes out it's Superman, then the new bat first the new Batman films, then we get World's Finest the crossover movie between the two. In an yeah, that, ideal that would, world, that would have been fine. Like at least two Superman solo Superman movies, and then the guy like the the the, the nonstop Superman uh, Batman fanboys could have their like literally it hasn't been even like a year yet since like Nolan's thing wrapped up. No, not not even a year, and it's just like if people are already saying reboot, reboot, like eh, people are so fucking hypocritical. Like one second they say, oh, we we're tired of reboots, and but it's not, but all of a sudden that whole facade of hating reboots, hating reboots, just kind of falls away when they're talking about Batman. Everyone wants a Batman reboot. It's just like, and they're impeding on like another character's like franchise for this, and I'm like, come on, dude. Like give like somebody else a chance. It's it's like Batman's like that guy, like that little kid who's just gonna wants to be in everything. Exactly. Like 
Yeah, he's just like, hey, look at me, I'm Batman, I'm Batman. Like, we get it, you're Batman, fuck, damn. Yeah, still, just what they... Man of Steel, it's going to be a big mistake if two things are going to really hurt Man of Steel 2 if they fall, if they do these two things. One, if... Uh, sorry. If they lose focus, it's Superman's story. Mm. That's going to be the main problem, because it has to be Superman's story. I'm saying Batman will be used to accentuate a point. That's all I'm seeing right now. I could be wrong, but I'm just saying that Again, as I mentioned earlier, kind of the arc and the viewpoint. It was kind of seen like kind of how they influenced each other and this king. Basically, someone coming from Luthor's perspective of being swayed to the side of Superman that way. That would that would be good, but it's the only reason the I'm thing not it, against like Batman being there if it's not a world's finest movie. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm I'm not, I'm not I'm not angry. I'm just yeah, that would be great if if it was like, uh, but then it's just gonna make it super Batman's movie. Or just like Batman comes along to Superman's side, and like uh, I don't know, it, it, like it's no point of me just complaining because it's gonna happen, and I am gonna go see it, and it's gonna make billions of dollars, and like it's just like I don't I don't understand why people are so mad at me for bringing up these minor quandaries, and it's just like you know it's it's still gonna go through like my you know my uh, like inane whinings won't change anything. And it's, it's 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 people calling me Superman fanboy. I'm I'm just like you know fuck all that shit. Doesn't matter. Well, the other thing is that they shouldn't just sell tickets to a fight. I'm gonna, that's gonna be the hugest mistake if they do just that. Yeah. It has to be they team up in the third act or something. Exactly because you know I I, I, I I'm just gonna stop talking about this. I like the. I just hate them to, to, for Batman to just whip out the kryptonite ring and just bitch slap Superman around, because it's like you, what, the, what we see him do in the in, in Man of Steel. I mean, like it's almost it would look kind of silly to have you know Batman beat Superman. It's like, dude, you could literally level a building by sneezing, and here comes this like you know little you know rich boy in a bat costume with a shiny rock, and all of a sudden you 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 turn to wax. It's just like, oh, for the love of God. Uh, you know what I like, the uh, way I always kind of wish they kind of highlight this more, the way Batman attacks Superman without kryptonite? When I say that, I mm-hmm. mean just like, of course, Superman could beat Batman I'm not without kryptonite. Of course, I'm not saying of course. that isn't possible. What I am saying, if, by, I'm going to say this, I think Batman would outsmart Superman in some way as he has in the past. I'm not saying Superman isn't smart at all, because you know, he's clever. Like, look at the late Mr. Kent up to Superman in the animated series. The guy's a genius at times. You know? Mm-hmm. He's, he's smart. He's clever. Super clever. That's what you want from Superman. But what I'm saying is that he, uh, I always want Batman to attack the senses when dealing with Superman before the kryptonite. Yeah, like, if, if they don't use kryptonite and they actually have some intelligence in how Superman brings him, brings him uh, Batman brings him down for, like, the first fight... I mean, like, like uh, even, like, I don't yes, know. follow me on this, would you? Mm-hmm. I'm a big gadget guy, so I kind of figure out if you, what Batman could use when dealing with Superman. Uh, smoke pellets with lead grounded into the powder. Ooh. So he can't see, so he literally can't see through them. Huh. Also, a, kind of a device, a little more elaborate, but kind of a device I always like kind of to see would be a... A device that would kind of a solar reflecting panel that would emit red light to so kind of be in a circle pattern, kind of like we did from a red sun, but kind of more miniaturized and accessible. Oh, huh, I was kind of like luring him to an environment where he would be that. But also, I'm saying like, look at Dark Knight Returns. It's using kind of a. I love it when he uses Sonics on Superman. Oh Sonic yeah, that, that would be interesting. Uh-huh. Super hearing and also you know, I guess well you know also the vision tear gas. Well, I mean, no, not tears. Like solar, solar flares and solar, so uh, flashbang devices. Hmm. You know what I'm saying, just yeah, again, attack the senses. You know, maybe even the, maybe even the smell. He used acid in the, uh, like a like a corrosive acid in one time he fought the Man of Steel. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's like those ways, but yeah, you know the other opening I had in mind. If you yeah. didn't start in Gotham, just kind of a to serve a point, mind you. It would go ahead. It would basically. I always kind of save this for like uh, what I would like to see with Justice League, just showing what what each of these heroes bring to the team. What you could do is you have Batman kind of not in what I just described, but in the 
There's a hostage situation going on. There's a building full of hostages, and the villain is the Riddler. Riddler has these people in death oh. traps, and you showcase the intelligence and you know a little bit of the strength and ability of this guy. Basically, Batman would take down the henchman. He uh, uses, you know, uses mind to uh, get people out of the the hostage traps. And basically, what he would do against Riddler, I kind of use this verbatim from the Justice League idea I had, but the uh, he would walk, just walk the Riddler. Said, "I knew you. I know you did this, Enigma. You followed." You said this, your next plan's this, you know, except just saying, I'm unraveling you as I'm just walking towards you. Basically, this is what you did, this is what you're going to say, and this is what you did. All the, answering all these riddles as he's approaching him, then basically the same exact scene I just mentioned before, and, you know, thanks for helping out, and, you know, Superman, is, oh, Superman. transition, ah. Just kind of showcasing what this guy brings to the like how he can contend with Superman, just showing this guy has merit on his own. Mm-mm. And that would be cool. Because he's going up against Luthor, and you know, Luthor's a smart guy at the show. This guy's equally as smart, but also able. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I'm really interested in seeing how Lex, Lux, Lex Luthor would come out in the, in the uh, sequel. i tell you one thing, Milan, but, about uh, Lex Luthor. Yeah. As much as it pains me to say, I think Brian... They've denounced this, and I... Brian Cranston has been a name that's been tossed around for the role of Lex Luthor, and that'd be a great idea. The problem is I want him so badly for Gordon. Brian Cranston. Is he the one who, uh, Breaking Bad? Yeah, Breaking Bad. He voiced Gordon in year one. Huh. And he, we, we did a whole review on that. That was, that, that was him? Damn. He, he, he can act. Oh, yeah. I'd, li- I'd like, I know he's the, uh, he's also like the, um, the goofy dad from Malcolm yes. in the Middle. You know, I hate that show, I mean, but like, he's the best part of it. Yeah, oh yeah, because uh, that's the thing about that show. All the care, well, not the kids, well, the, the kids are fucking just little yes. pricks. They're just like, just like whiny little pricks, and their poor freaking mother. And the father is just on the on the verge of a mental breakdown. I'm sorry, poor but the mother? say. <laughs> Ah, the mother just seems like overburdened by these little shit stained kids. Uh, but like th- th- that's that's the thing that the father, he's just like he's the same guy from Breaking Bad, and that's just mind blowing. That this you know adorable little middle aged man. Oh, I'm a little middle aged man. You shave his head, give him a goatee, and make him make cocaine, make him create drugs, and boom, instant badass. That that is acting range, my friend. Let me to just say this on Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah. I don't like the show, yet it somehow I end up watching it for some reason. Don't ask me. I guess Brian Cranston's the only mm. saving factor, which is a fact, with what I'm about to tell you. There's one episode that's coming on, all right? An episode comes on, and basically uh, three stories going on. Uh, Malcolm and uh, the Reese kid, they're basically trying to partake in some sort of incestuous... Uh, re- it's some sort of ancient custom. Basically, they're trying to marry somebody who I think is somehow related to them. I'm not sure. Did the grandmother set him up anyway, with somebody? Once, yep, you were saying? Anyway, you got this twisted story with Malcolm and his brother. They're, tr- they're fighting over the affections of a girl their grandmother set up for him, which is like some ancient homeland custom, which is really stupid. But the uh, – anyway, that's going on. In the meantime, you have uh, the mother, Lois and uh, the Dewey kid, who he was also in Finding Nemo, by the way. Not Nemo. Mind you, he was just one of the kids. He was Tad, uh, I think Tad the Seahorse in that movie. Oh. Sorry. Anyway, uh, off track. Anyway, basically, the other kid's like going to some sort of recycling. He's at an airport, and basically the mother subconsciously wants him to fail. So she's uh, so she's basically hurting this kid, incidentally, but still hurting this kid. I'm thinking, oh, I literally shat at my TV when I watched the show, Milan. Oh. Like, Come on! Like, you, you, she, fis- I... she blinds the kid, hits the kid, and... Crushes his fingers. I... Oh my god! I I haven't seen that episode. I know it's, it's been terrible. it's been it's been a while since I actually seen that show. She's very well, unlikable. I hate her. I hate her very much. I really do. Huh. This is me talking here. I know, and you're you're like the you're like one of the nicest, most likable people ever. Damn. But also, here's the saving grace. Brian Cranston's story in this episode is hilarious. He's so great. He, I know Brian. I haven't seen Breaking Bad yet because I can't get like the first season's not available or something. I I, I wish I would like the. I hear good things. I hear it's like Heart of Ice, but uh, prolonged is what I've heard the comparison to. 
I haven't I haven't checked it out yet, but I like Brian Cranston. I know he's a good actor. Just seeing Malcolm Mill and I see year one. Just those two things tell me that he's a great actor. Seen him in some other stuff like John Carter, and I've seen him in Argo. Good actor. He's doing such great comedic stuff here. Basically, he gets his story in this as he finds a car so he can get to one of those airport lounges, you know, the, the high executive suites. Uh-huh. So that's what he's doing. Basically, he bumps into a guy, and he, he steals his card. And basically what he does is he gets in there, he's just getting all this free stuff like massages and he's like uh, gourmet food and stuff. And basically he ends up being mistaken for this man in a, a video conference, because people had those back then and today. Uh-huh. A video conference about this some sort of deal that he, hasn't, he knows nothing about and we know nothing about, just saying a yes or no. And basically it's a multi-million dollar deal that will either impact people bad. They'll either impact people horribly or benefit people, which we don't know. Basically, he's just faced with this decision. He just says, uh, yes? Are we the good guys here? He says, <laughs> what's good? <laughs> <laughs> so he has no idea. Basically, he said, well, I'm trans- we're turning $64 million to your account. And we <laughs> – it's hilarious. His story is hilarious. And the Christmas episode I watched recently was the only time I ever liked the mother. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, they don't, like she uh she has a meltdown and basically she's wrecking the car because someone does something very inconsiderate to her, like just dings her door and doesn't apologize for it. Hmm. And literally, while she's standing right there, she doesn't. She's Lois is in the car, and uh, this woman just like dings her door to her car and says, "Well, it's not going to hurt the resale value." And basically, she does the same to her. Dings her, dings her door, and basically they get into a car battle. They're ramming each other's car, wrecking the car. The point is, it just brings Brian Cranston as hell to insanity. Basically, they say they're making homemade gifts because they're out of cash, which you know tells you how good parents these guys are. But uh, <laughs> sorry, because they're very reckless, is what I'm getting at. But the point is, uh, Brian Cranston says, uh, "Okay, well, here's what we're going to make make each other gifts this Christmas," and they make each other gifts, and they're expecting like lousy gifts, and he's making this kind of this nice endearing gift that he's making boggle with their faces. On the pieces, like a handmade like toothpicks and stuff with cutouts on there. It's a nice gesture. Point is, he, he's making that for the family, a homemade boggle game. And they, the kids bring him like a, a really well-made picture frame with picture in it, and they, they get him good stuff. And basically, he's like caught off guard. <gasps> and he's saying, uh, my gift is, uh, he looks over, he says, I can't give him that. And he's saying, uh, outside. He basically, the whole episode... He's talking out of his rear, just trying to fool. He's trying to find a gift on the run for Christmas time because he has nothing to contend with the great stuff they gave him. <laughs> it's a homemade wooden clock, a homemade wooden clock, and it's uh, and basically they drive. Well, he throws himself through a, for a gas station window to try to sue, get some cash at the last second, but it doesn't work. Hilarious. Oh yeah, Brian Cranston. He's my yeah, go-to uh, actor. When they ask me who I would think for role, I think, well, Brian Cranston's my go-to guy, so he could play that role. He could play that role too. Yeah, I, I think he's a little bit too old to play Lex Luthor, but yeah, Jim Gordon. I gotta say that he was so much more, much more better than as Jim Gordon. I know. The thing is, that's the problem. That he, I watched the Year One interviews from the animated film. The interview for uh, Year One is like it was on TV or something. You can find it on YouTube. One is he says mm-hmm. he would like to play the Riddler at some point. A character like the Riddler or the Riddler. And I think, ah, oh, he would be great for that. But then I'm thinking, well, then I hear Lu- Lex Luthor. And I'm thinking, oh, man, he could be great for that. Because, you know, Luthor, I think Luthor could be a little older. It doesn't really. Like, Clancy Brown's Luthor is, eh. He's not, mm-hmm. not a young guy, but not an old guy either. But still, I think it's Luthor, you can stretch a little bit with that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. If they, I think that if they're going for like a Justice League thing franchise, then like you know Brian Cranston, you know he's already in his like fifties, isn't he? I think it's early fifties. Yeah, early fifties. But you know, it's like. Yeah. Point is, he's a really. The... Oh, sorry. No. Oh, I'm sure you could pull it off, but like most of these films kind of come out like ten to five to three years in advance, like apart from each other. And so by the like, by the third movie, he would be like sixty something, and yeah, it's it's not really. Then by that point, you got like a thirty something year old Henry Cavill, basically kicking the crap out of like this sixty year old bald guy, 
And it's, you know, it's Brian Cranston, so it's like Superman's beating up Brian Cranston. What the hell? Well, unless he dons a giant mech suit, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose so. Like, uh, I, people said, like, oh, I want manipulative, you know, Lex Luthor. And I do want that. But I also love the mech suit. People, you know, some people, like Ian, for example, he hates the mech suit. Bill loves it. I like the, I like the mech suit a lot. But I also love the manipulative, manipulative, you know, uh, the yeah, word that I want to say. Manipulative. 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 Blah, 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 stupid tongue. The you conniving know, for, Luthor. Cunning and conniving yeah. Luthor. Yeah, so he, he, like he doesn't need to do he, he just uh, you know uh, engineers all the all Superman's enemies and just kind of well uh, essentially he's the mastermind. I, I like mastermind Luther as long as he doesn't as long as his scheme does I I don't want any land schemes. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll vouch for that. like a reference to it. Not even a reference to that, but just like a line Gene Hackman said. That a line would be kind of funny. That like, if they had funny. one of the best lines from the original Superman film is, uh, if it's amazing, the human brain can generate enough power to keep those legs moving. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He's, he's just making fun of Otis, you know, uh, something along those lines would be funny. But uh, it's not uh-huh. that I don't trust you, Otis. Well, that's it. I don't trust you, Otis. What'd you do? <laughs> but, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I could, uh, oh, yeah, what I was going to say with Luther, yeah. Yeah, uh, I like. I don't mind the mech suit. I think it's okay. I like it. You know, it's all right. But however, if I had to choose between two, I'm going with Kanai and Luther because I love, you know, Sir, him in the anime, Superman the Animated Series. True and justly, he donned the armor, and since forth, he's donned it a few times, especially in the comics, you know. Oh, I love uh, the animated series uh, Lex Luthor. Um, I, I love that Luther because he's just so conniving. Yes. But the thing is, I love the fact that he's an African-American Luther, where at least he's mixed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, he, he's white in that. So he kind of went for a Telly Savalas look in the design. So they kind of oh. did the same thing with Harvey Dent. So he's white, but it's tannish. Oh uh, well, no, Har- Harvey uh, Harvey Dent was obviously like Italian, Italian, like dark skinned Italian. Like, but like, like Alex Luther, really? I, well, Luther is modeled you... after Telly Savalas. Oh, I gotta check out who this Telly Savalas is. Is it because he was like tan, bald, deep yeah. voiced? Yeah, it's like, oh, huh, interesting. When I was younger, I wondered the same thing, friend, so you're not alone. But uh, it's because of the uh, – I think it's because they kind of – it's a thing in the animation they pronounce the lips, so kind of some questions, and the, and the shading. No, oh, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it would be cool, though. Uh, tell I don't have a problem with it. I'm like, thinking, okay, this guy's different because I yeah, was just watching it because that was my first introduction to Luthor. I'm saying, oh, man, this guy's awesome. Yeah, t- so what's the name of Telly Savalas? Uh, Telly Savalas, yes. You know, it's, actually, in the 78 <laughs> Superman, they mentioned in the 78 Superman that he was going to be in it as a cameo because pe- for some reason they linked him to Luthor even early on. Superman was going to like look for Luthor. He's going to like tap this guy on the back of the shoulder because he thought it looked like Luthor. He says, who do you love, baby? Who do you love, Soupy? Nah. That, it's a Telly Savalas thing, but yeah. This t- – what? This guy looks nothing like 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 Luthor. Well, he Luther, played Bo- he? Blofeld once. Huh. I'm saying it was back then. I I just that's what Bruce Timm said. Okay, so I I, I kind of see the resemblance, but it's kind kind of etched me. It's been a while since I've actually seen Tully's balls, but he looked like him when I saw him last. No, not like oh my god, like nothing like that, like Luther, like literally nothing like him. I, I, I don't get it. Like, tell me some folly. It looks, it looks nothing like, like, looks like, like maybe, like, you know, I'm, all the pictures I'm seeing of him are him old. That that's might be. Like, yeah, like, it's, that's the thing about all these golden age actors. They look old all the time, even when they're, when, when it's like black and white pictures. They all look like they're at least in their 60s. Like, dude, this is back when he was 20 something. All these old guys have city miles on them. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, of course, when I think of Luthor, I think of this one line from the Superman animated series. Every time I think of Luthor, I can I can only picture this line. Yeah. Is the meeting in the third the third the three parter pilot of the Superman the animated series the third part when they're in Metropolis and after he spoiled John Corbin's uh, robots suit scheme. Uh huh. When John Corbin was a terrorist and he hijacked the robot suit that Lex Corp built, all of Luthor's grand design, mind you. What happens is uh, Superman is like just like floating outside Luthor's window, 
door opens, like literally clears out the guy that's in his office and says, Ah, yes. Hello, uh, Superman. He floats in. Basically says, well, listen, uh, uh, Superman, I own Metropolis. I, my technology built it. My will keeps it going. And half its uh, – two-thirds of its population work for me whether they know it or not. That's the line. Mm. It's just that, to me, is Luthor. And it's delivered by Clancy Brown. That – oh, it's great. It's great. Uh, oh, like it, in this one picture uh... – who loves your baby? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. I can see it in like younger. So all I see, he could play Lex Luthor, but I I can't see. Like, he looks like Luthor if he if he was like younger a little bit. But yeah, like I, I, I see don't see him at all in the animated series. It's like nothing. You know, what show you know you should check out Milan. Yeah, the Dean Martin celebrity roast. The Dean Martin celebrity roast. Dean Martin. Is back when roast celebrity roast had class. Yeah. Oh God, they gotten so fucking trashy now. Barring what, barring Seth MacFarlane, because he can do no wrong. <laughs> I would say, well, yeah. but I could be wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, Seth MacFarlane, he's witty. Yes. You know, say what you will, but he's a witty guy, and he has a certain kind of you know, like dry class to him, oh, but yeah. also having that kind of Boston kind of barroom ha 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 funny joke. But like, yeah, like, like, uh, it's it's ridiculous. You know, I'm a huge supporter of Seth MacFarlane. I love the guy to death. I really do. Oh, I, I I love him. People don't give him enough credit. Exactly. Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, God damn I it! I loved like, him. I loved him when he hosted the Oscars. To be honest, with you. oh yeah, getting too oh, much yeah. flack. Yeah, it, that's the thing. It's just like, it's funny because like this guy was just kind of a film school buff, like making like cartoons and stuff, and now he's hosting the Oscars. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous! It's like it's like, hey, somebody like from we're making YouTube videos now. We're hosting the Oscars. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But like, yeah, like uh, roast shows are just these mean, mean spirited, talentless hacks being hacks at each other. Ugh. Hey, Milan. Yeah. I was wondering. Uh, I feel kind of silly asking you this, but I was wondering if I could take advantage of your. Immense vo- uh, vocal prowess for a moment. Hold on. Your uh, uh, yeah, sh- immense yeah. vocal prowess for a moment, if I may. Sure. Uh, could you impersonate Adam West for me? Adam West. All right, let's see. Hello. Holy. No. Um. Say something. Like, what would something Adam West say? Like, I can do the voice, but I don't know any dialogue. Yeah, let me think. Uh, just... Robin, it's very important to donate to our schools and to our schools and charities and by paying the parking meter we pave the roads which lead to these schools. Okay, I get, I get, I get. Sometimes you just can't get rid of a bomb. <laughs> Robin, we okay. Robin, we need to pay our taxes. Something like that. I don't know. I, I can't. I do a terrible uh, Adam West. It's ridiculous. <laughs> do you do, sir? <laughs> Lousy uh, Cesar Romero Joker. <laughs> Cesar Romero. Oh, he, people don't give him enough uh, credit. Oh, I get that. <laughs> the batteries are dead. <laughs> Hand me the bat, uh, bat repel, uh, shark repellent bat spray. I love that. Something that cracked me up, uh, I saw a clip of Batgirl, she's, she's contacting, uh, she's contacting, I think, Chief O'Hara, and she mentions Commissioner Gordon, and for a second, it's just really silly, she says, my, my father, uh, Commissioner Gordon, she's about to say my father. Uh, I know, that's adorable. I gotta say, I gotta say, Batgirl in that show was, Rather hot. I mean, it's just like... Uh, mm, just oh, Yvonne Craig. Yvonne Craig, damn. Anyway, I gotta go, man. Okay. I have not slept. Well, I'm sorry, I have not slept all night. And I've been doing stuff all day. And my body is shutting down. That's why I'm not as witty and fast in my comebacks as I normally am. My brain is... Shutting down. But anyway, um, yes, this has been Milan. You know, guest starring once again on Blue Dragon 5's you know channel. I had a lot of fun. You know, 
Sing us out. Blue Dragon 5. Thank you for tuning in. I thank you. It's been a blast. And thank you for tuning in. Da, 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 da. Oh, my God. You should sing more, man. I'm being serious. I'm not, I'm not patronizing. I'm just, damn, you have a singing voice. You're a crooner. <laughs> oh, oh, you're too kind. No, I'm serious. Like, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra eat your heart out. Damn. <laughs> Take oh, that, Dean idiot. Martin. <laughs> damn right. Up yours, Dean Martin. Blue Dragon 5 is on the road. Fun success. Anyway.